I want to get into an investment question and talk to you about um, the UK budget situation and what its potential implications uh, are going to be, knowing that you don't speak for the service anymore. But from an investment standpoint, a lot of the investment is going, for example, into new systems, Type 26s, for example, new submarine successor. Um, is there, and, and the criticism made by some of the analysts is that each of the services has, has reduced training, reduced number of people. Does the equation have to change and the unmanned autonomous system become kind of an equal to these systems as opposed to sort of boutique afterthoughts that get tucked in around the portfolio? I mean, I've pondered long and hard on this. Uh, there's no cliff edge change coming. It's not possible uh, professionally, it's not possible politically. So really we're talking about a synergy between the current path of delivery and new opportunities. And the new opportunities, particularly in, uh, in advanced technology, need to be very carefully chosen so they, they have a synergy with the existing. And that means not trying to argue that you are um, uh, that you are supplementing existing systems, but that you are complementing them. Now, how long that complementing goes on for, in ASW or in AAW or in any form of, uh, of, 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 of warfare, uh, is a matter for conjecture. But I would say that the MCM and the ASW world is ripe for a very long and careful uh, consideration. And I've always been an advocate that ASW and MCM is ripe for artificial intelligence. And, and that's anti-submarine warfare and mount, mine uh, countermeasures, uh, two of two of the hardest problems to solve in the naval uh, naval domain. But, as, but uh, they are, Vargo, they are the fundamental problem. If you don't own the underwater, you don't own, any, own anything, yeah, including, exactly. by the way, space. Because if you have a reach to space from the underwater uh, with a free will, the space doesn't belong to you either. So I think we need to be really clear that that is the domain to own. Yeah, yeah. As, as we found uh, uh, repeatedly throughout history, um, it's a very hard problem to solve, but if you don't get your arms wrapped around it before the conflict starts, mm -hmm. afterwards it's going to be a challenge as two world wars demonstrated. Well, all um, of the big players, all the big global players are wrestling with this conundrum. And whereas in the democratic West we are around a a cycle of uh, five-year political terms or in the states for, you know, does that provide the continuity of investment and political leadership and resource investment that makes these programs deliver? And the answer is compared to states where there is no political cycle and you can take a 25 or 50-year program, you're already up against a very different construct. Um, if I look at it on, on, on the surface, um, it looks like it, it is a, a, a true Royal Navy renaissance that's underway. Um, uh, Defense Secretary uh, Sir Michael Fallon made it clear that you know, this is the year of the Navy, for example, the focus on it. Uh, Prince of Wales uh, named uh, over the weekend, Type 26 program uh, underway, something that you worked very, very hard on. Uh, you and generations of First Sea Lords worked very hard on the carriers. You uh, um, uh, christened or helped or, or were there when uh, Her Majesty uh, christened Queen Elizabeth. Uh, Type 31 program has been launched um, and other naval aviation upgrades as well. F-35 program on track, but there is a budgetary hole uh, and, and there is a concern that the size of that hole could gobble up entire programs. There are folks, for example, who are looking, you know, Successor was launched, uh, the Dreadnought class was launched, uh, the program was started, I should say, but now there's talk about a 12 billion pound cushion being put into that. That's the size of the, almost the full equipment budget. How serious is this funding challenge and how, what are the potential trade-offs that may be necessary and, and is there any way that your successor, uh, Sir Philip Jones, manages to inoculate his force from the impacts of some of those budget changes? Well, first of all, um, Sir Philip has the responsibility and you know, I, I'm a huge supporter of his words just a few hours ago where he said, you know, tough decisions need to be made. Um, you know, but tough decisions have been made over centuries when it comes to deciding the balance of investments to achieve strategic outcomes. But at the heart of your question, which is not about the Navy really, but about the whole of uh, Western defense and security, and let's include Europe and the 2% question in this, you know, not enough money, not enough energy, not enough research is being done and um, is being invested. And as a result, uh, we see shortfalls everywhere. So these are political responsibilities. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's all very well for politicians to uh, laud the uh, arrival of a new 
decision on the ship, which might deliver 20 years after they've gone, um, but they are still responsible for initiating a process where young men and women might lose their lives in that vessel, which is why both Sir Philip and I have always said that the vessel has to be a credible warfighting platform, not credible as judged by a minister um, for overseas sales, but as credible as judged by the young men and women who serve in it and by the enemy who faces it. So these are political questions and political ownerships and the military do their very best in extremely difficult circumstances to get the books balanced uh, and to try and make the most of, of a difficult time.